the diet culture is a, are you ready for this? Are you ready for where we're at money-wise? A $71 billion a year industry. Well, hello there. My name is Catalina Herndon. I am a certified personal trainer and nutritionist. And thank you so much for coming back to my channel to see what I'm going to talk about this week. As promised, another week, another video. I am three for three so far, and I'm really proud of myself about that because that's my longest streak. So thank you so much for being here and for your support. This week, we're getting a lot more serious. I'm going to talk about diet culture. As we get closer to New Year's and all of the magic energy that New Year's resolutions can bring, I want to advise you and educate you on the beast that is diet culture. Come with me on this journey. Let us talk about this and let me help you understand how you can still focus on health and wellness and how to best create a temple out of your body, your mind, and your spirit without succumbing to the pitfalls of a multi-billion dollar a year industry in this age of hyper-perfectionism, the selfie age, and instead, do you boo. Does that make sense? All right, it will as we unravel this. Let's do this. Step number one, it's cold in my house. So I'm going to be sipping on this tea. This is a nice Earl Grey Jasmine. It's delicious. What is diet culture? Now I'm, I'm gonna try not to butcher this young woman's name. UC San Diego dietic intern, Anita Darianani, defined diet culture as a set of beliefs that value thinness, appearance, and shape above health and well-being. So sacrificing your health and well-being for a societal expectation of thinness, current trendy body image and shape. She went further to say, additionally, the concept places importance on restricting calories, normalizing negative self-talk, and categorizing certain foods as good or bad. Let's talk about that definition a little bit. I think that puts everything perfectly in a nutshell. Diet culture is so prevalent. You, you see it even amongst children. It's amazing. In cafeterias, all over advertising. It's so prevalent at this point that it's internalized for each of us, both men and women, I will argue vehemently. So I want you to think about what are some different ways that we've, each of us, succumbed to this, internalized it, and made it a part of our daily rituals and habits. I know that I work in an industry that benefits off of diet culture, but I actively try to push against that. I don't want to demonize food. I don't think good foods or bad foods exist. I think that the habits that we create around ourselves that add to negative or positive lifestyles, all of this will snowball and add to or take away from your health. Simple as that. I think that you can absolutely love yourself, love your body, love lots of different qualities about yourself that have nothing to do with your body and want to make changes with your health and body. Those things can exist at the same time. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. You don't have to hate yourself in order to make changes to your, to your body. That's taken me a long time. I used to be in the dance culture, in the dance world, and I remember skipping lunches and sipping on SlimFast instead. And I would do this just weeks before a show to try and slim down before a dance show, before a dance recital. Obviously that's terrible. That's not how the human body works. That's not how a young woman's mind should be focused and obsessing on and work. We will talk about how we can work individually to just unravel that. Let's take this even a step further. In a very recent article and episode, CNBC estimated that the diet culture is a, are you ready for this? Are you ready for where we're at money-wise? a $71 billion a year industry. Now that wasn't always the case, but it has increased exponentially with the sale of diet food and pay per month apps 
and streaming services. Everything from Atkins to Noom, right? Weight Watchers monthly. I mean, everything adds to that industry. Now, of course, personal trainers, gyms, all that stuff gets added into it as well. So I'm not above that, I'm still included. But good God, a $71 billion a year industry that thrives off of making you feel like you are not good enough. Something about that really, really sits wrong with me. I don't like it. What I don't like about it especially is that it thrives off of your insecurities with a societal standard that constantly shifts. Let me tell you a story. One of my dearest, bestest friends, Tania, she and I grew up doing Pop Warner Cheerleader together. So when I was eight years old, I was in second grade, we were in Wildcat Pop Warner Cheerleaders while her brother was football player. And we won City of Tucson that year. It was really cool, it was amazing, it was so much fun. We worked our butts off, we had fun with it. It was amazing. I remember at that age being told directly and also feeling the impression from the adults around me, not my parents, who were not coaches or anything like that, but you know, who were on the outskirts. Not from them, but from the other adults who were involved in our routines, in our costumes, in different things like that. I remember multiple times feeling the impression and being told directly that I was big, that I was a bigger girl. I was tall and I was thicker than the other girls. I was eight years old, hadn't hit puberty yet. I remember Tania, she was, she was always tiny. She was tinier than the rest of us, being told that she was too little. We always had to take her costumes in. She was very skinny, she was little. I was too big and she was too little. I look back on it now and I realize in all of the pyramids we had to do, I was always the base, right? I was the strong, sturdy base. And she was always at the top of the pyramid. We both had an important role to play. Our bodies served a, a purpose. On that note, I think that it's important, it's important to realize that our bodies each had a purpose to play. I, I think that that's a wonderful thing that I took away from it. We could have taken a negative nothing was ever good enough. Maybe it wasn't that I was too big or she was too little. Maybe society just doesn't like women. I, I, I think that's true as well. Because again, this standard is always shifting. In the 90s, it was the super cocaine skinny, Kate Moss, hip bones jutting out, collarbones jutting out, rail thin, model skinny kind of standard. That's what everybody was striving for. That was a horrible time to be a, a prepubescent and pubescent teenager. It really was. I am not built that way and I will never be built that way. And putting that pressure upon myself, let alone being part of a dance community at that time, was really hard. It truly was. And now the beauty standard is the Kim Kardashian, um, you know, BBL, um, Brazilian butt lift kind of standard where you want to be curvy in all the right places and then skinny in the waist. So if you naturally have an hourglass figure, you're off to a good start. Then you just gotta build a booty and you're good to go. But that's not attainable for naturally thin women. Then they're left feeling like, what did, what can they do to possibly attain that kind of standard? How can we, how can we live up to these standards that are constantly shifting? It just blows my mind. And the older I get, the more I realize that that's how this industry continues to thrive is by shifting the standards. And it's always been that way. Every decade or so, the standard shifts of this, this beauty standard of men and women. I think that's important to understand. Looking back on it now as an adult, I can see that both Tania and I served a wonderful, valuable place in our cheerleading squad. I was the base of the pyramid. My body had a wonderful purpose to serve. And she was the top of the pyramid. Without either of us, we wouldn't have had a pyramid at all. As a teenager, it was hard to see that. It was hard to understand that, but as an adult, I see it now. So that's important. Perspective is key there. But when you're in the throes of that, it's impossible. Also looking back on it now, it's so important to understand that we are so much more than our bodies. The diet culture and industry doesn't want you to feel that way. As you're working on your body and trying to make healthier practices for yourself through nutrition and through fitness, you're, you become hyper-focused, almost obsessively, about your body, your flaws, about the things that you want to change, and you lose sight of all the wonderful other aspects of yourself, about what you're, you know, you're, about the amazing things your body can do. Let's focus on that, but also who you are as a person. You're a wonderful friend. You're brave. You're smart as hell. You are a fabulous team member at work. You're a wonderful daughter or son. 
you're a fabulous mom or husband, all those other qualities about yourself that have nothing to do with your body. What about person positivity? not just body positivity. And that's one of the things in my previous last week's video that I was talking about, one of the YouTubers that I follow talked about how the body positivity movement took on a negative mind of its own and a negative spin when we took it too far by over-focusing on the body at all. When you commented that somebody looks great because they've lost weight, what, then what did you think about them before? Or maybe this person is incredibly ill and they've lost weight without meaning to. And, and you're, you're hyper-focusing on just one quality about them as a person. They are more than just their body. Imagine what would happen to the diet culture industry if we all woke up one day and loved ourselves. Ooh, I got goosebumps just thinking that. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? It would crash and burn. And granted, folks like me might be out of work in some ways. I don't know, I think gyms would be all right. I think that trainers who focus on human positivity and balance and wellness would be okay. But I think that folks who, who really hyper-focus on the physicality of it and the looks would struggle. The obsessive calorie counting, the demonizing of foods, I think that they'd have to rethink their strategies. And that's okay, because humans are so much more than that. And food is so much more than calories in and out. Oh my gosh. One of my favorite experiences that Joe and I have had, my husband, is uh, we went to Quebec to interview for a postdoc experience, or opportunity rather, that he had there. I learned early on there was a, a gentleman who was part of their postdoc program. He was a professor. What ended up happening is every restaurant that they took us to, you let this gentleman order for all of us, for the entire team. Table. He would order appetizers, the foods, the desserts, and the wine pairings for everybody. And you you sat back and you let that happen. And oh my gosh, I have never eaten such amazing foods. Can you imagine if I had been obsessively dieting? I would have missed out on so much living in those moments. And you do. You miss out on so much living, the experience of sharing food with your friends and families and loved ones. It's an experience, it's not just fuel. It's not that simple. Come on, there's so much more to it than that. Thank goodness. It's a wonderful blessing to be able to share food with your family and friends, especially around the holidays. I wouldn't want to miss out on that and I wouldn't advise any of my clients to miss out on that either. So I digress. But the idea of the diet industry one day waking up and being obsolete because all of us decided to choose us and to love ourselves makes me pretty giddy. I like that idea. It thrives off of your insecurity. Every time you scroll through Facebook and you see the diet teas and the detoxes and the juice cleanses and all of those other things and you think maybe that's the thing this year that will push me and motivate me and, and you know do the things to get me to this body ideal that I want you give them your money, they, uh, they win a little bit. $71 billion a year. That's amazing. Take that same time, take that same money and invest it in yourselves. At the end of the day, like I said in previous videos, it comes down to nutritional awareness and understanding and education. It comes down to a fitness program that you will stick with, that you enjoy, that helps your body and your spirit and your mind thrive. Invest in that, both time and money. I'm not sure what that's going to be for you. I can't tell you what that's going to be for you, but I truly encourage you to find it, okay? Let's move on. What does that look like? How do you break free from diet culture? In a $71 billion industry, do you know what the stat is for failure? 95%, meaning that 95% of people who invest in that $71 billion a year industry will lose weight and then put it back on, or won't lose weight at all, or won't meet the goals that they set for themselves when they started. So how do you break free from that diet culture and succeed on your own? Number one, knowledge versus obsession. In a lot of the research I did for this video, a lot of the people I was you know, watching TED Talks, I was reading papers, scrolling through different universities, um, papers in their athletic departments and that sort of a thing. And they talked about the difference between knowledge and obsession. Think about that for a second. 
a lot of people don't realize how much food they're actually eating, either under eating or overeating. I encourage a lot of my clients to track their food for two weeks, only two weeks. I don't want you tracking food forever. That's obsessive. It's annoying. If you are an athlete, if you're a physique athlete, if you make money off of your body, then you've committed to this kind of lifestyle and you're probably gonna be tracking food. Or you get so good at it after a while that, you know, you can eyeball a tablespoon of olive oil from outer space and you don't need to track it. If you're not making money off of your body in this industry, then I don't encourage you to track your food for longer than two weeks to a month. Once you get an understanding of how much food you're actually eating and what your body's nutritional requirements are, then back off. Do not become obsessed with food. Learn intuitive eating. Learn your body's natural signals for hunger and fullness or satiety. What does 80% of fullness feel like for you? What does it feel like to actually feel full? and not overstuff. One of my clients right now that I coach remotely, I am so proud of her. We have made very small, simple shifts in her diet and she's down 20 pounds in the last two to three months. It is very important for her to lose this weight because she needs a hip replacement and her doctor wouldn't do the hip replacement until she lost about 20 or 30 pounds to give her the best fighting chance of having a successful surgery and recovery. So this wasn't necessarily, this wasn't just her wanting to lose a few pounds. Granted, that's part of it. This was incredibly necessary for her medical and physical safety. And she's doing it by making small, sustainable changes. She's not working out heavily. She's, she's walking on a treadmill at a gym, or her local gym, for upwards of about 15 minutes, doing some small cable circuits, two to three little circuits, a couple of times a week. She's not lifting heavy. It's all through nutrition. She's doing all of this through nutritional changes. It started with just becoming aware of how much she was eating and what the calorie requirements of her body actually were. So the difference between knowledge and obsession is huge. I would like you to be aware of what you're eating, not obsessed with it. That's one of the first methods of breaking free from diet culture. Educate yourself. Don't rely on anybody else for that, not even your personal trainer. Your personal trainer should be educating you on how to do this yourself. The second thing, and it's part of that, is understanding the difference between deep health and wellness versus dieting, restricting. Those are two very different concepts. Deep health is a combination of a lot of different things that make you feel good that help your body thrive and your mind and your spirit. You should feel good about the changes that you're making. It should help you reach some of the goals that you have regarding your body and your mind and your spirit. And maybe that is weight loss and muscle gain and seeing changes in your body that you want to change and feel. But if it's intense restriction and dieting, cutting out entire food groups and less medically necessary, a lot of that leads to eating disorders. A lot of that leads to a very shallow life experience. And I just can very rarely recommend any of that to my clients. I've had very few experiences with coaching um, physique athletes, for example. And I'm not sure if I ever will again. At the end of the day, I don't like coaching hungry athletes. <laughs> it's tough. It puts so much strain on them physically and mentally and emotionally. I'm not sure if it's worth it. I know that those goals can feel amazing. You're up on stage, you've pushed yourself to this physical and emotional limit. And especially if you win, it feels worth it. And then what? And then what? Are you the person you want to be after that? Do you do another show? I can't answer that for you. But what I can say is on the human level, I'm not sure if that lifestyle is appropriate for most average people. I'm, I'm, I am sure, I'm pretty sure it's not. Health and wellness are very different than dieting and restricting. There is a way to lose weight, to gain muscle and health in a way that doesn't require intense restriction, 
A lot of people can help you do that. I'd like to be a part of that journey with you. But more than anything else, I just encourage you again to educate yourself on it so that you do not rely on anybody else for that. The information's out there. You don't have to put yourself through nutrition school. You don't have to put yourself through a certification program. A lot of that information is out there. Pick up the books, go through the uh, YouTube seminars and stuff like that. It's there. Break free of the multi-billion dollar industry that wants you to dislike yourself. Love yourself for who you are and want to work on yourself at the same time. They don't have to be mutually exclusive, but stop giving your money, your time, and your self-worth to an industry that wants you to hate yourself. Okay, I think I've made my point here. It's your body, it's your life, and it's your power. Claim it, all right? All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Drop a comment below. How have you broken free from diet culture? Or would you like some help with that? I would love to be a part of that journey with you. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. This is my three for three video. We're gonna keep this train rolling. Thank you so much for your support. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, tune in next week because I'm gonna keep this going. Adios.